Good morning. It's Monday, July 21st, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 29, and my name is Chris. And man, do we have a great show today. A lot of big stuff going on. And one of these stories, man, does it hit close to home. That's why, my friends, I have gathered an esteemed and, you know what, semi-incredible group of Mumble co- colleagues who will go through these stories with me and we'll chat about them and see how they resonate with the people. So welcome, Mumble Room. Are you guys ready to get started today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Always. Okay, good, good. All right, well, let's start with uh, everyone's favorite topic, Edward Snowden. Uh, Edward Snowden, in uh, at the HOPE conference that I watched the live stream of as well as I could, I was definitely having some stream issues, uh, but uh, he says he plans to work on technologies to preserve personal data privacy and called on programmers to join his efforts. Speaking via a Google Hangout at the Hackers on Planet Earth conference, which stands for HOPE, or HOPE stands for that, Uh, Today, he hinted, without providing any further details, that he's going to be doing some of that work himself. He also wants like-minded hackers to work with him in some some capacity. So he's saying, you know what, it's time for us to make tools, and I, Edward Snowden, am going to code some of the tools. Uh, Mumble Room, if the Edward Snowden version of TrueCrypt came out, would you use it? No. Mm. I think that's a resounding... Wow, look at that. Yeah, I'm not too sure about that. Yeah, I'm not either, to be honest with you. If it was open source, yeah, that's audited. a big part of it, right? Yeah, that's a big part yeah. of it. Good point. I, yeah. I might look take a look at it, but I don't know if it, I would actually actively if it excites me too much to want to go after it. You know, one thing I will say is, uh, if Edward Snowden were to release a privacy tool, and Edward Snowden were to open source that privacy tool, you know, there would be a lot of eyes on that code. So it would be one of the more, I would assume, publicly audited pieces of encryption technology or whatever it is, right? I hope yeah, it's I not. Agree. What I really hope, what I re- and we're, this is obviously just a story we're gonna have to follow. This is the very beginning of a new chapter. But what what I really hope is it's not he becomes a figurehead at some company whose like brand is security and privacy, like the Black Phone folks or the Dark Mail Alliance. I, I I like what those people are trying to do, but I don't like the idea of using Edward Snowden as a figurehead to promote a brand. I hope it doesn't devolve into that, which it seems like it he could even maybe uh, involuntarily on his on his behalf, uh, devolve into that. Anyways, we have a link to the Recode story if you want to read more about it and maybe try to suss some, some out uh, what he might be doing and let us know, give us your insights. You can also find an embedded version of his talk at the Hope X conference, which just wrapped up this last week. And anybody get to uh, watch the uh, Snowden live stream in the Mumble Room? I know some folks in the chat room were. I watched some of it. Uh, it was pretty hit and miss. Like, as soon as Snowden got on, it seemed like they were having some connection troubles. I didn't even know about it. Speaking uh, of connection troubles, I've been trying out an iPhone 5. Ting was kind enough to send me one for free to try out for a little while so I could compare Android L and iOS 8. It's early days because they're both beta, but I want to spend a lot of time with both operating systems. So I thought for the ultimate deep dive test, I'm leaving for OSCON tonight. I'm going to take the iPhone 5 with me and see how it does because at these conventions, I've always had an Android phone. All right. So. Guess what launch? Guess what lands today? This is a massive story that we're going to be probably hearing a lot more about soon. But a well-respected forensic expert who has a lot of experience working on iOS and iPhones has uncovered what he believes are backdoor services included by default in iOS, even current up to like 7.1 releases of iOS. Uh, these are pretty massive ones too. As part of recent hackers on Hope Planet, uh, the uh, the Hope Conference. Uh, This presentation was given about this, so this is the same uh, conference that Snowden was at. Forensic scientist and iPhone jailbreaker Jonathan Zardesky detailed several backdoor security mechanisms that are secretly included in iOS by default. Jonathan confirms that iOS is reasonably secure from an attack by a malicious hacker, but notes the mobile OS includes several forensic and noticeable design omissions that make the OS vulnerable to professional forensic snooping utilities, perhaps used by those like law enforcement. Services that are built into iOS that included on every single iOS device shipping today include Lockdown D, PCAP D, and Mobile File Relay, which can bypass encrypted backups and obtain data that can be utilized via USB. PCAP D, if you're familiar with that, is a packet capture daemon that can be activated in the background. Some reports, I believe, are mistakenly reporting today that that packet capture is running all the time. That's stupid. That would kill the battery life of every phone. If every iPhone had a packet capture running constantly, iPhones would have a three-hour battery life. But what it can be is activated through a forensic tool system, is what it appears to be the case. 
Now, this is a direct quote uh, from Jonathan here. Uh, this is from an article over on MacRumors.com. And you can find it on OS News as well and a few other places. He says, this is the quote, I'm not suggesting some grand conspiracy. There are, however, some services running in iOS that shouldn't be there. That were intentionally added by Apple as part of the firmware and bypass backup encryption while copying more of your personal data than ever should come off the phone for the average consumer. So what he means by that is these are not for, de for, these are not for developer debugging purposes. Because if you're doing developer debugging, you don't need to go that deep into personal data for people. Uh, Consumers who want to limit access to these services on their iPhone do have some actions, some mitigation techniques they could take today, according to Jonathan. They can enable a complex passcode in their iOS device and also get your hands on the Enterprise Apple configuration application to set mobile management restrictions and enable pair locking, which will delete all pairing records. This solution will block third-party forensic software but will not protect the device contents if it's sent to Apple for analysis. Now, the other thing to note about this story is the mishmash of technology. Some requires physical access connected to the Lightning port. Some of it, depending on what you're trying to go after, looks like it could be activated over Wi-Fi. So if the phone is on the network, you do potentially have the uh, ability to activate some of this logging remotely, and there, according to this research, is zero indication to the user that anything has happened. It all happens transparently in the background, it dumps to a file that's stored on the file system, and then the authorities could go grab that file when they have physical access to the device. Anybody in the mumble room shocked by this? I'd honestly have to say no after it was recorded that it was recording your GPS coordinates in previous versions of iOS. Right, that I'm database that wasn't getting trimmed. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's almost ludicrous if you think about it. I don't have any state secrets, but there's plenty of companies that use smartphones that do. And to think that they actually have the technology readily available to law enforcement means that foreign spies could just as easily acquire that technology. That's the key thing to underscore here, is a backdoor that's in there for law enforcement is actually a backdoor for anyone that discovers it and learns how to manipulate it. Uh, and that's why, obviously, these are uh, independent hackers, researchers. Uh, Jonathan Zawinski, who uh, has found this, he's not a law enforcement official, but now he knows how to take advantage of it. At the same time, we do have to figure that if you are anybody that's operating at the scale of Apple, you have but zero choice to cooperate with the United States law enforcement agencies, right? I mean, that seems to be a given. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it seems to me like, you know, if they know that they're putting this in there, somebody's going to figure out a way to exploit it. It, it, it. If if it's a good guy, great. If it's a bad guy, that's a big problem. Well, they don't even necessarily have to figure it out. They If they can just steal the kit that the law enforcement uses, then they can access right. it. Yeah, and it could leak online one day, and it could show up on a torrent site. This has happened before. Uh, so what we need to see now is a response from Apple. Uh, and... You know, it, uh, the flip side is, is like PCAPD, right? Well, that's a Unix utility. Well, guess what's sitting underneath iOS? Perhaps that's there for other reasons, and it's implemented poorly. I mean, there could be a lot of different things here. This is all coming out of the Hope Conference. He actually, it's funny, he published this paper a few weeks ago, uh, or maybe even a couple of months ago. I can't remember now. And it didn't get any traction, and I thought, okay, well, maybe his research didn't hold up. And so we talked about it, I think, once on TechSnap, and it kind of died away, and we thought, okay... Is, you know, maybe there's something go something else here. And then he covered it at the Hope Conference, and he put it in a presentation form. He put it in a PowerPoint format, and now everybody's talking about it. So we'll see where this goes, and we'll see if Apple responds uh, later in the week to this. If they do, which I doubt they will, but if they do, it'll take them probably a day or so. Uh, let's shift gears. Let's, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about Google before we get to a really cool uh, device that's going to let you run Linux and Android apps side by side. Uh, we're going to get more into this in tomorrow. Tomorrow's episode of Tech Talk today when it comes to just watch smartwatches in general. But I thought this was pretty telling. It turns out, this is according to the information, the information is a tech news website that requires like a $1,000 yearly subscription to read. But as part of the subscription, you're allowed to reprint what they report upon. So 9to5Google has done just that. And they say uh, that Google and Samsung's relationship is getting particularly bad right now, and it's because of wearables. So as you probably know, Samsung currently sells three smartwatches that run Tizen which is a Linux-based, open-source operating system, including the Gear 2, the Gear Neo, and the Gear Fit. These are pretty recent. Uh, we've talked about them in the past. The company only offers one Android Wear-based watch right now, the Gear Live. Google wants Samsung to focus its efforts more on Android Wear than Tizen. Not too surprising. Now, according to this report coming out of the information, the tense relationship has gotten worse 
As the report claims, the Google CEO Larry Page and Samsung Vice Chairman Jay Lee took part in a very tense private meeting at the Allen Co. Conference last week in Sun Valley. The meeting reportedly centered around Page being frustrated that Samsung was investing more in Tizen than Android and was pressuring them to focus more on Android and drop the Tizen line. The CEO of Google met with the vice chairman of Samsung at a separate conference with the explicit intention of pressuring, Google, uh, pressuring Samsung to drop Tizen. Now, does this not exactly wow. underscore my prediction that I made a f a last week when we said that uh, they were pulling back on their Tizen phones? Yeah, this really does. It's, <clears throat> this looks a lot like they, they were strong-armed. It's pretty interesting. We're going to talk more about smartwatches in uh, tomorrow's Tech Talk today. We got a good panel going, and we asked if people really want smartwatches, and we looked over some recent reviews, and we got some really good varying opinions. I was pretty surprised. But I want to talk about a rumor that we might not get to cover because it's probably going to break tomorrow while I'm at OSCON. Now, don't worry. We have some great shows lined up for you while I'm at OSCON, so do not fret. I want you to download every episode because they are great. But this is probably going to break... NVIDIA Shield tablet, re rumored to ship July 29th in the U.S. for $299, US 16 gigabytes, Wi-Fi only. If you go $399, you'll get a 32 gigabyte with LTE, and they got a $60 controller. It's a full-fledged gaming tablet. They're taking the Shield from the handheld model, and they're bringing it to a, to a tablet with two front-facing stereo speakers, much like the HTC One. It's an 8-inch tablet with a 1920 by 1200 resolution, 2 gigs of RAM, a Tegra K1 system on a chip with 192 CUDA cores, a quad-core 2.2 gigahertz A15 CPU, and the tablet's uh, got a 5 megapixel selfie camera, too. <laughs> what's the, wait, what's nice. the price of this thing? What's that? What's the price of this going to be? Uh, 299 or 399 US, depending on what your specs are. See, that I don't know about that. I would just rather buy like, a small like Ultrabook tablet or something. Well, or, I mean, if it is going to be running Android games, like, yeah, well, what, what's the point? Well, think of this as you're going to get an Android tablet. What this is going to be is this is a really well-built tablet uh, that is exceptionally good at video gaming. So if you want to do an Android tablet anyways, and maybe like your Nexus 7 has gotten a little long in the tooth, why not go this route? You get an 8-inch tablet with an incredible resolution and the best gaming performance. And the other thing I'll tell you, I, 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 would, not, I would be like you, honestly, right now, if it weren't for the fact that I actually freaking love my current generation NVIDIA Shield. And I bought it because I, wanted to t I, want, I, I thought it was the dumbest device ever. I thought NVIDIA was crazy. I thought they were... No. I thought they were just ego, e egotistical, but then I used it. It's really good. And they curate the Play Store with the best apps that work on the Shield. I mean, it's a really good experience. So if you could put that in a general tablet, I like that. I, I, I prefer the Shield form factor, but... Yeah, the Shield, like the original Shield made a lot of sense because it's smaller, and you have the controller that goes with it, and you throw in some emulators and that thing, and it's awesome. But yeah. yes. I don't know, a full-size tablet, though, that's kind of... Yeah. I don't have this... Uh, yeah, it kind of takes away point. some of the portability. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. you know, one of the other things that's really nice about the Shield is even the current generation has really good speakers. And because because the screen is a flip-up screen, you just set the Shield down on your table and flip the screen up, and it makes a really good little screen to watch a, like a video or something because it stands up on its own. You know, you don't have to prop it up like you do a tablet. Uh, so, but so you can close it up, and it's always protected. Yes, that's nice, too, especially with the kids. You know, and it's much easier yeah. for them to carry around, too. More drop-proof. Doesn't mean you know. It doesn't mean they're going to drop it because honestly, the way the the way Android works, you really could just have you could keep both lines: the handheld uh, controller version and a tablet version. Because if you want the tablet version, they have a controller you can get with it, and then it's probably the same exact button maps that's in the little Shield unit. So you could probably you know, use well, it's almost like an Xbox controller. Yeah. What I what I'd like to see is the handheld with uh, Chromecast support. Yeah. Well, Android's getting it. I don't know if it'll work for gaming though. That'll be the, that'll be the test. Although this thing's the got some streaming, serious horsepower. All the streaming aspect stuff of the Shield doesn't make a lot of sense and not really usable, but the actual Android gaming part of it does. Yeah, and Android so, gaming's getting good right now. There's a lot of good games coming out for Android, especially with emulators. Yeah, yeah, that thing rocks as an Android uh, as an emulator. Rocks, rocks, rocks as an emulator platform. Best emulator platform ever. Kids and I love it. 
for that. All right, I want to talk about something that's just cool, something I'm going to watch. Just a quick note here. Uh, Micro X Win Creators, uh, you might be familiar with Micro X Win a little bit. They make a kernel-based X Windows implementation that's pretty fast uh, and lightweight. And they've come up with a unified Linux distribution that runs Android and Debian simultaneously, which is a pretty neat concept. I've always wondered when this would happen, and I'm surprised it took this long, but it's probably harder than I gave it a uh, than I really gave it credit for. So here, I'll play a little bit of the video so you can see it. It does run on an ARM chip right now. Uh, specifically, oh, I didn't note the specs, but it's like a, it's a dual core, kind of standard one, one plus gigahertz uh, ARM processor. So you can see right here, here's an example where here's the Android, he's in Android, and uh, he can jump between uh, Android apps and Linux apps. Let me uh, fast forward a little bit. Here's a TV app he's in. Uh, here's a, here he is on his desktop. And uh, he'll switch here, and I'm trying to. I want you to get a kind of a concept. Here we go. So here's on the desktop, and I watch him switch from. Uh, here's his task manager under Linux, and I think here in a second he will uh, start up an Android application. Yep, here we go. And you can kind of get an idea how what the performance is like running an Android application side by side a Linux application. It's an interesting concept. I think now it's gotten to the point where there's actually a few Android apps I wouldn't mind having on my Linux desktop. I'm looking at you, Evernote. I'd like, I'd, I mean, if I could take the Evernote Android version, that'd be fine. So there it goes. Now, yeah, so there it goes. Kind of cool, kind of a cool concept. I'd, buy, I'd pick one up. You know, if this thing was like 100 bucks or something like that and it ran uh, Linux, desktop, and Android apps, heck yeah, I'd buy one. And uh, so, Sounds like a great place to put just, you know, yeah, a little playground. I mean, he was running Lubuntu there, but I mean, there's more touch friendly uh, desktop environments yeah. like Unity he could well, be using. And it'd be great for developers, too. Just do a little testing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a little debugging and stuff like that. Last but not least, you know, one thing we didn't really get a chance to talk about, I just wanted to do a make good. Actually, this isn't the last story, but it's our second to last story. Real quick, is Kindle Unlimited worth it? You might have heard about the new Kindle Unlimited $9.99 for all you can eat books. Only certain books, and it might only be in the U.S., too. I don't know. But uh, the Washington Post, yes, they're owned by Android, or <laughs> they're owned by Amazon, or Jeff Bezos specifically. They say the chances are if you're not reading more than one book per month, it's not worth it to you. Uh, so Pew did a, a survey and asked how many books a typical American has read in the past year, and the answer for the typical American, five books a year. We got the whole chart in the show notes. They broke it down by age groups. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the median for folks in the 18 to 29 age group is five. 30 to 49, 5. 50 to 64, 5. There's some, uh, there's some high ends and low ends there. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, here's one that's interesting. Okay, if you make less than $30,000 per year, you're likely to read three books a year. If you make more than $75,000 a year, you're likely to read eight books a year, according to the Washington Post. I don't know. I think that there are still going to get a lot of subscriptions on this because people don't think about that. They think, oh, this is going to be a lot of books that I can just... Download and read and then be yeah, done with it. I don't like anything like this where when you cut off the service, you lose access to the goods. That's yeah. actually why I'm, even though Audible has DRM, when I end my Audible subscription, I still have access to anything I got during my Audible subscription. And to me, because I know there are ways to remove that DRM, that seems like a good enough deal to me. But with this, it is not that. I lose access to everything when I stop I don't want that. It's a book collection. You know, it's there's classics you want to go back to over the years. That's true. Dude, Stallman would not approve. Stallman, yeah. Stallman would definitely agree with you. He would probably think something uh, like it uh, being... Uh, it's negative in the freedom yeah. dimension. I think that's probably what he would uh, think. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's not worth it because the books I typically read are close to a thousand pages and they take me a month to read them. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't be getting the value out of it. Yeah, no. Yeah. All right, last but not least, I've had a lot of folks write in about Wi-Fi woes into some of our shows, so I just wanted to cover this story. Links is take them or leave them, but they've got a new Wi-Fi range of extenders. They're kind of cool, in my opinion. they got the AC1200 Max Wi-Fi range extender. They've also got the N600 Pro and the N300 Wi-Fi range extender. But here's what's cool. The prices range from 60 bucks to 100 bucks U.S., the Linksys AC1200 Max Wi-Fi range extender, for example, gives you an additional 10,000 square feet of coverage in your house. But I also like this part. This is something that for a long time the uh, Apple, uh, what's that, uh, Air, Air thing, Air, Airport Express thing would do. And I was like, oh, come on, Linksys, make one of these. Well, now they have. The Linksys range extender also includes four gigabit ports for connecting wired devices on the other end, like consoles or smart TVs or Blu-ray players. There's even an audio jack on the back allowing users to plug in a stereo system or audio speaker and then wirelessly stream music from a smart device or computer. Kind of cool. So if you got out time, yeah, spotty Wi-Fi. Here's a you see the picture of it here. It's not too. It's like the size of a power uh, brick. 
and it gives you uh, the gigabit Ethernet, it gives you the audio jack, and it extends your uh, Wi-Fi by 10,000 square feet. I thought that was pretty neat. So it almost is just like the Airport Express, just not. Yeah, it was way cheaper too. Starts at sixty bucks, goes up to a hundred bucks depending on what you want. If you want like yeah. N and super high speed and stuff like that. Because I got one of those in storage right now, uh, an Airport Express. But you know, Linksys might be a better option at some. Hey oh, hey oh, there you go, my friend. There you go. So check it out. We'll have a link to that in the show notes, including a uh, direct link to all the models if you just know which one you want. Now let's wrap it up. This is. Uh, I'll be back on Thursday for my next live tech talk today. So please. Come back and join us on Thursday over at jblive.tv, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And uh, do do me a favor. Check out the uh, pre-recorded episodes for tomorrow and Wednesday. We had uh, Wednesdays, so Tuesdays we had a great smartwatch discussion along with a lot of other stuff. And on Wednesdays we take a great look back at the history of the Internet from ARPANET all the way up to the proto-podcaster in the early 90s, including one of the best demo fails of all time in uh, Wednesday's episode of Tech Talk today. Before I go, I also want to remind you, you can become an investor in the Jupiter Broadcasting Network and help us accomplish our goals. And honestly, keep it a little weird by going to patreon.com slash today. That's where we are funding the Jupiter Broadcasting's future endeavors. And you can help us do that. Any amount you can afford, it's a per month pledge. $3 is the beginning level. We also have swag levels down below. You can go check out the default pledge levels and see what you want to jump in at. And I really appreciate the help. Patreon.com slash today. We were talking about portable gaming. We were talking about the NVIDIA Shield. It is truly amazing when you see one of these new gaming devices, the level of performance we are now getting out of portable gaming. It's unbelievable. And it honestly makes me feel so, so damn old. So we'll look back at a 1980s Nintendo Entertainment System Metroid commercial. And this was one of those commercials that made me a gamer. The challenge is Metroid. The power is Nintendo. Defend the planet Zephus against the evil Mother Brain. It's survival or destruction. Do battle or die. Metroid, only from Nintendo. Play Rad Racer. Play with power. It's turbo speed in 3D. It's treacherous tracks, hot cars, hairpin turns. One mistake and you'll roll. Rad Racer, only from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power.